What is going on, everybody? Bobby, Bobby Fire with my man, Goldie. We are going to be talking through this week of the NFL. I did another show with Rody for our picks video. Me and she did a very early look earlier this week. And I uh, wanted to focus on Goldie because Goldie has been doing a lot of us stuff for us behind the scene. Uh, basically, we have Goldie's projections up on SaberSim. You can check them out every day. And it's really an information aggregate. And I know we, we've talked about it before, but Goldie, if you want to just give a real quick explanation of it, and then we'll uh, we'll start talking about this week's slate. Yeah, man. Sorry, excuse me. I'm coughing here in the background. Um, no worries. The, uh, yeah, the aggregate that we're pulling in, um, we're basically going all, uh, all around the industry. Um, since everybody is is really providing projections uh for most every dfs sport that that we can play now um <clears throat> you know on both dk and fanduel we go around the industry to uh really everywhere we can and and try and pull in um everything that that everybody's saying and and then we basically take all of the projections and the ownership numbers and and throw them into uh kind of a mishmash of our own um you know, in our own little pot, right? And uh, and then we spit out <clears throat> kind of an, an aggregate, which is uh, you know, sort of a, a custom weighting of every projection system that we pull in throughout the industry. So, um, really, it's just a a good measure of where the rest of the market is, mm -hmm. and you know, with all of these different projection systems, you know, assuming they're they're good numbers, right? Um, and they're not just throwing out total garbage. Um, you know, the more projection systems that we have going into uh, an aggregate, then you know, the more accurate the uh, really the the market sentiment uh, will reflect, right? So um, that's really what we do with it. <clears throat> and like I said, we do it with uh, projections and ownership, and and then we put our own little kind of spin on it um, as well. Sheets does a little bit of the same thing with his projections mm -hmm. in in that he just uh, has has back tested um, some of the particular stuff that he pulls in, you know, for historical accuracy and, and all kinds of that stuff. So, um, you know, I do the same thing and and just put a little bit of a a custom spin on it. Um, well, that's awesome, in, in that re in that regard. So, uh, yeah, man, we've uh, we've got it up for a couple of sports. Um, well, we're working on every sport that we can get. So, you know, everybody just kind of stay tuned for it. Um, right now, the sort of the main show is NFL, but um, we're working in the background to uh, to get it up for everything. So, Well, awesome, man. We really appreciate it. And I think it's something, guys, like I really hope you guys take advantage of this because I don't, there's no other site out there that's doing this. And and we are slant, we, you know, in general, Sheets' projections and everything uh, and Goldie's, you know, we're going to slant towards the things that are, Goldie's is, is really an information, you know, like, like he said, like it's, it's everybody's, information but at the same time like i don't think there's anybody out there doing any of this so it really gives you it gives you a good feel what everyone else is doing and ways we can get different and i guess before i get into it goldie like what i usually go through is i like to go through the positions and all that stuff and i'm happy to do that with you or we can go games but i thought it'd be good to, to maybe just talk about maybe some games that you like that are maybe against the field a little bit or or lower you know games that, that you think the situations where they should probably be higher owned um, and maybe talk a little bit about that stuff. Is there a game that you specifically like this week that might have a little lower ownership than you would have thought? Is there something like something along those lines is what I was looking for. <clears throat> well, I guess we can. Yeah, I think that's a good way to approach it. Um, you know, we got a, a bit more football com content coming out on a regular basis um, every week. So I think, um, you know, this is a good way to look at a slate. You know, we know where a lot of the the chalk is going to come from usually right uh it's 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 the usual suspects um it's the high scoring games like the giants in detroit right and it's uh you know baltimore is going to be targeted right mm -hmm. um things like that so we 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 know that detroit's defense is bad and everybody's probably going to put up points on it we know that chicago and atlanta are probably going to score right mm -hmm. but how do we get different and <clears throat> really i think that's where the the ownership aggregates really shine right mm -hmm. because with ownership specifically um you know a lot of all of the sites are are a lot more variant you know in their projection in like a projection for a quarterback everybody is pretty much in line for the most part but uh you know a projection an ownership projection on a 4k receiver you know you could get wildly different 
uh, numbers from various sites, right? So I think right. the the aggregate ownership really does shine in that regard. And using that, I think there are a couple of games. So we can, first of all, start with one that I was really looking forward to, as a matter of fact, um, Cleveland and Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Now, um, that's a totally different story now, right? Then, then, then. Saber Sim has probably hasn't even updated enough. I mean, this game, I think it's is it is it six full points that it's gone up since they decided to move to Detroit? Something like that. Right. Yeah. It uh, the total has moved pretty high. I mean, there's still one spot in the market. Maybe the the data just hasn't updated. It's still sitting at 42. So we're looking at six and a half, even seven and a half points on the on the total movement to the upside mm-hmm. from 40 to the low 40s up to the the upper 40s. And obviously, this is playing being played inside now in a dome so this is definitely one of the games that we could have targeted but now we probably may want to think about dropping down another ownership tier right mm-hmm. um that said you know you're the chicago atlanta game still going to be the most popular um right. and the the giants detroit game is going to be popular as well um so getting to a couple of pieces in this game i think is still kind of warranted right now before we probably wouldn't have been able to um, play a whole lot of Cleveland, but that kind of changes things now a little bit right. now, right? So yeah, I think I mean, um, you, got, you got Donovan Peoples Jones, who was fine as everyone's darling play last week, and he's forty six hundred. I know it's a tough matchup in general with the Bills' corners, but yeah. uh, Justin Jefferson didn't seem to think so. So um, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> it feels like a spot they're going to have to throw the ball, right? I mean, why why wouldn't we be into this one? Certainly, and and I'm leaning. Uh, I mean, Bills are still laying a huge number here. You know that hasn't changed, and if anything, it's right. gone. It's come down a little bit, um, mm-hmm. but the total is skyrocketed. So that really does suggest that Cleveland is going is also going to be able to score here. So um, I think getting to some Amari Cooper, whose price did drop this week, mm-hmm. um, and his ownership has has been cut at least in half. Yep. I mean, he came in in a lot of spots at twelve fifteen percent last week. So yep. um, showing him right now uh, sub three percent from the last aggregate, you know, that I ran earlier today. Um, or right at 3%. I think that's a really good play. Uh, he's not, I, I, I kind of agree with you in that a lot of the industry hasn't fully adjusted to this yet. Yeah. Um, so in the next couple of days, we'll have uh, a bit better data to come in, but I think something, you know, getting to a little bit of the Cleveland passing game with DPJ and some Amari here is still pretty warranted. Um, mm-hmm. and in, in fact, you know, one of the spots I was really looking forward to was playing a little bit of Nick Chubb in the snow, uh, I thought that was really yeah. kind of uh, an like inverted no sort of exactly an inverted sort of uh, super contrarian spot that nobody is going to play because it's really right. not a very good spot uh, here. However, he's still going to be at, at low ownership. And honestly, I'm probably going to come off of that now. You know, mm-hmm. so I think we get a little bit, um, you know, get some tastes of going both ways, guys that we can get on in the passing game in particular, and maybe some guys that we could have played like a like a Nick Chubb. Uh, or even some Kareem Hunt that mm-hmm. are, are probably not, you know, as um, uh, as contrarian as as they may have been before. So, yeah, um, I, lo- I, lo- I love what you're talking about here, and it's funny because yep. I-, I wanted to, to touch on a couple of things. That what one thing is like I, I still think even if people do shift over, it's not going to be crazy. Um, it is no. a really tough individual matchup for Cooper, and as good as of a re- as good of a receiver he is, is he's not Justin Jefferson who can go out there and and basically go out and have a chance at getting forty against anybody. Definitely. Um, but Peoples Jones, I-, I will take secondary receivers in a must throw situation against a Buffalo team with a top rated, you know, with top corners on uh, you know on Cooper. Um, but but I, so I want to throw that out there. I also everybody always wants to play the and I, including me, I always want Allen and Diggs. But Gabe yep. Davis is the guy who wins all the money because he's always low owned. He has a massive ceiling. I would argue that it's, I mean, you could say he has the highest ceiling and and uh because I think he has the highest fantasy scoring game ever uh for a receiver. He had what in that 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 conference championship last year when with the five touchdowns, right? Yeah, touchdowns? whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah, 250 yards received, whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Um he's got a massive ceiling and he's a guy who who looks to be, you know, somewhat ignored this week. And this seems like a good spot. It's funny because you'd think that naturally this game will end up being more chalky but i think that you know playing davis is one way to get different uh playing people's jones seems like it's a way to get different and if if injoku plays i actually have a little bit of interest in, in injoku if he doesn't i'm open to harrison bryant but mostly i like i like dawson knox as a way of getting different in your bill stacks what do you think about that as a way of getting off of some of the chalkier elements within a stack that you already kind of like yeah i totally agree and as of 
as of now, we're showing Steph Diggs just under 16% um, in aggregate from the market here. And I think that's going to steam quite a bit um, mm -hmm. as, as we get into the weekend. Um, like, honestly, it took probably four hours before I, before I even realized they moved the game. You know what I mean? So a lot right. of the, the, um, the industry is probably still not aware that they've moved the game. Right. So, um, this is, that number is going to steam. So I do really like getting to some Gabe Davis, uh, or even some Dawson, Dawson Knox at 3,200 and both of them sub 5% ownership to differentiate your bill stacks. Uh, but don't also, you know, Josh Allen's only coming in right now at about 6%. That's probably going to go up as well. Um, and, you know, the 8,500 is 8,500. It's not easy to get to. But as of right now, he's projecting uh, – let me kind of quickly go to a, a, a full quarterback uh, projection here. He's projecting, man, right in the top three with Lamar and Jalen Hurts, right? So they're all within I – mean, we've got them within a third of a point. So, um, you know, don't forget about Josh Allen as well at 8,500. Uh, we know that he has not just – upside in the, in the passing game um in right. which case both yeah in which case both Dawson Knox and Gabe Davis can get there but uh he has a lot of rushing upside as well um so we still gotta you know keep an eye on his elbow and, and all that kind of stuff but like he played last week he was fine right so um I think that's a very good way to to get a little bit different uh with our initial ownership projections is just go to one of the best teams in football against one of the worst defenses in football um, and, and just play, play the best guys, you know, like sounds pretty easy, but, uh, yeah. you know, oftentimes we overlook that. So I think this game is a, a good spot to get contrarian, um, mm -hmm. right off the board and it's a very high total. It will steam a little bit. So we'll keep that in mind, but, yep. um, really good spot. I think. Totally with you on everything that you said, basically. I mean, I really, I really like that spot and I, and I, I agree that it's going to get much more high, much higher own throughout the industry as the week goes on. So keep an eye out for Goldie's projections on Sunday morning. We'll uh, 11 a.m. AM, AM Eastern, uh, me and Rody and Cheats go live. But uh, we're going to get Goldie on more of those shows because uh, he's got really, really good take on, on a lot of these numbers-based things. And I wanted to touch on a couple other things that, you know, we talked about the Chicago-Atlanta being the more popular of the games. Yep. The cool thing about quarterbacks this week is basically uh, the industry aggregate has has nobody above 10% owned um as a quarterback now probably somebody ends up 12 percent in the higher buy-ins like justin fields maybe 15 percent as, as that would probably be the highest um but i think there are, are some ways we can maybe we can maybe still justify a stack here i mean while we think everyone's going to this game uh nobody's going to the receivers <laughs> you know what i mean like seven percent six percent uh probably not going to go for zacchaeus but nobody's going to play chase claypool at two percent ownership there They'll go to the the tight ends in pits, and and you're gonna have to explain this one to me like I'm a five year old. Cole Komet, yeah. basically none of these other four K ish receivers have put up a game like Cole Komet's put up two times in a row. And by the way, two two two, two missed in the end zone mm -hmm. on top of those mm -hmm. uh, that that that, that could have been an even a bigger game. Why wouldn't we think that maybe he Fields is figuring something out with him, especially against an Atlanta defense that's one of the worst in the NFL at covering over the middle? So it feels like Komet is getting way overlooked here. And I know one way of getting a week really different with this stack is what about if you're going to stack this play pits and commit together? Yeah, that's an interesting way to play it. Right. And it's certainly a way to get different. I think, um, you know, in a lot of respects, uh, a double tight end in, in game stacks is, is really just underutilized just kind of in a general theory sense. 100%. Right. So I, I think that's um, very playable. And Cole Komet, you're you're exactly right. Now I do think there is a little bit of noise, right? Last week he caught a 60-yard touchdown pass or whatever yeah. it was. So, um, you know, some some variance is definitely going to come with that. So that's really the only stuff we got to be aware of, I think. But, um, you know, really where I still balk. I mean, I mentioned it in the the kind of overview um, with Justin Fields is that you know Chicago's offense they're still only throwing the ball you know less than. 30 times a game yeah yeah right? yeah. They're, they're, these are two of the lowest throwing teams in the nfl with the highest right. total on the slate which is we almost never see that right exactly exactly so i think there it might be a little fishy um and something that we just kind of have to be careful with when we're now buying a twenty three hundred dollar price bump on, on justin fields like obviously we we know the upside and you still get to project as one of the top plays of the week 
Um, but I'm with you. I does think he even need, does, does Fields even need to throw the ball? To, like, well, that, I mean, that's the thing, right? He's break, breaking the record for rushing yards, and and I don't think it's. I'm not saying he's going to get 170 every week. It's not going to happen. But I, I expect him to be, you know, in the 80 yard range most weeks. He's capable. They're there. They have design running plays for him. They're running some option plays. Don't you think that we should be expecting that those, you know, that that at least what 30 percent of the time he's getting to 100 yards rushing or 20 some odd percent of the time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he he certainly now that they're kind of letting him loose and he's getting far more comfortable. Um, I I think we we do have to start projecting him, you know, like. The days of five thousand fifty five hundred dollars Justin Fields are probably long gone for the rest of his career, I would guess. Forever. Um, <laughs> it, you know, it like this is the kind of talent uh, and optionality that he brings to the offense here. So uh, I'm I'm with you. We do have to start projecting him on a regular basis for a solid rushing load, and you know, similar to the earlier days of Lamar Jackson, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. So I, I I I agree with you, and um. You know, the really the only reason that I that I still balk is that um, there are a couple of other quarterbacks, you know, like a Jalen Hurts, like a Lamar, even Josh Allen, right, that are up in this upper price tier um, that we also have to, you know, make decisions on every single week. So I think he's just kind of in that category now where right. we, we don't do we can, he's not just an auto play at sub five thousand or sub six thousand. Right. right. Um, and that means you know, to your point earlier that we do have to start looking for other ways to kind of get different when we do play him. So uh, I think getting to a little bit of the passing game, you know, it, it is unfortunate. They, we just need them to throw the ball more. Right. And that's really why I prefer the other guys. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, they're throwing the ball 45 times and mm-hmm. fields may, may have 20 attempts, you know what I mean? So it, right. it's, there's a lot of opportunity cost. Um that well, said, I mean, just for what you... it's worth, Fields has won the millionaire now two weeks in a row and every yep. other tournament. Yep. And he's done it. So in some, in some cases, it they were, they had him naked with nobody. In some cases they had him with commit. Um, yep. The people were winning all the two fifty K the, the, my buddy who won the, the 250 K last week for the, uh, for the wildcat not buddy, we're, 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 we're DFS friends, whatever. Um, but he's a, he's a good dude, a Shrek uh, shout out to him, but he, he, he had a, he basically did the game stacks everywhere else and then just played fields as his quarterback, basically as if the way you would treat just a random running back play. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you, but I also think that like playing some of the passing game because no one's playing any of the receivers, like if everyone was on Mooney, that'd be one thing, yep. but because they're so, uh, so low owned, you you really don't need all that much to get there at 5,400. And, and what if the game script goes, Atlanta goes up by two scores. You're going to see a lot. You're going to see fields dropping back more than you're used to seeing. Wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. It, it's totally, it's not unheard of that he'll throw the ball 35 times necessarily, right? right? He, I think last week he did throw it 28 times or whatever. Mm-hmm. And with the rushing upside, uh, I mean, that's usually plenty. Um, it's just a, there's just a lot more opportunity cost when we're going up against these other guys, right? So um, right. he's absolutely it playable with all of these guys. And I, I really do like some Darnell Mooney at whatever we have him 6% here. Um, and same thing with Cole Komet. I, I would prefer Mooney because I think there's more upside at the price mm-hmm. um, than there is for Cole Komet at his price, right? But uh, Chase Claypool, they're also starting to incorporate him in the offense a bit more as well. So um, the passing game, you know, with my trepidations, most of the rest of the industry is probably going to have the same sort of feelings about it, right? Like, well, they just don't throw the ball enough. Like, well, okay, if you want to play a contrarian, then just play him anyway, right? right. So, um, so yeah, I'm I'm with you. I, I do think that Chicago may be figuring out the offense a little bit, and and Justin Fields' upside is really what's unlocking that for them. So mm-hmm. um, it, it's really going to allow the offense to just kind of breathe. You know, it, it's not just give the ball to David Montgomery and, and hope Justin Fields doesn't take sacks. You know what I mean? Like, right. And and for what it's worth, we I mean we saw this with Josh Allen early in his career. Like Justin Fields has an arm. Yep. <laughs> this yeah, this guy yeah. is this guy is an athlete. He is a cannon. He is if you had to create a modern quarterback for this type of league, this is this is a guy who's a lot like it. And 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 look, I love I'm the biggest Lamar defender there is out there. I love Lamar. I think he's the most underrated player, even though he won an MVP. He just gets so so criticized by all these guys as if he's not in the same league as them. I think it's just nuts. But I think that we're looking at a guy who who similarly 
you're going to see some 300 yard passing games out of him at some point in his career. I'd like to be ahead of the curve on that one. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. Uh, and like I said, I think they're starting to figure it out a little bit. I think over the last month, they have been the highest scoring and most productive offense in football. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it it's not just like in their in the conference or in the division or anything. like it's league wide. So, um, you know, obviously they've they've had some good spots, but, you know, this weekend is another good spot. Atlanta will give it up. So um, getting to some unknown pieces here and, you know, we're we are getting fields you know, sub 10% right now. I mean, the, the, the price tag on him is suppressing the ownership, at least in early runs. So, um, you know, there is something to be said for that. Absolutely. Well, let's talk before we get into a few, maybe specific guys that may, may stand out a little bit from a, you know, projection thing. And I'll throw some names at you, but other games that you feel like maybe not even that are, that are getting overlooked or underlooked, but maybe games that you're, you're into this week um, that we can talk about just from an ownership perspective and from a projection perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I mean, we'll keep it quick here because there's probably not much for anybody else in the industry to say about uh, the Denver Broncos, but yep. um, I, I like their passing game again, man. Like the Raiders have been terrible and I like, I'm, I'm literally just going to play the Broncos offense every single week and it, it's going to beat me every single week, I guess, you know? Um, but if I get it, if I get there once, you know, I'm going to be vindicated. Um, so I'm going to play him again. I, I like him. I think this is a really good spot. I think the Raiders have been awful and they're most attackable through the air here. So, um, Jerry Judy still has some question marks, I think, um, with the ankle. Mm-hmm. And I actually haven't read any, you know, confirmed news one way or the other. So, um, you know, by all account, I mean, he went out early in that game. So this last week, um, so that would suggest, and I believe uh, they did just put uh, KJ Hamler on IR today or yep, yesterday or something. Yep. So that means Kendall Hinton down here at 3,600 could be a yep. very valuable piece. They used him a, a good bit, and he got some work this last week after Judy went out. He did. So um, 3,600. took some shots with him, too, that he didn't, didn't quite get there, but they took some shots. There was a penalty on one that I think was they tried for, I mean, it was a bomb, but it, it didn't quite get there. But you got that upside with a 3,600. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And same thing with Dulcich. You know, he, he burned a lot of people last week. He was very chalky, but, um, you know, they started early in that game trying to get him to football. And, uh, I think he had whatever, two, three catches or something. Russ overthrew him on a few balls, you know, so there was some variance there that contributed to his, uh, disappointment. Mm-hmm. But, uh, at 3,800, I mean, I, still a perfectly playable price again and he's going to be especially with judy out one of the main focal points of this passing game so um obviously we can still get to Cortland sutton he got a price bump which i'm not really stoked about but yep. like his ownership's only coming in about 10 percent as well so mm-hmm. um russ at 58 i think is perfectly playable here also and i think it's a, a pretty easy kind of game stack to make yeah, because you know that, you're running it back with, right? It's obviously you you play Adams or, or Jacobs, and that's easy. And you could even throw Mac Hollins into the mix. Just because he had a down week, no one's going to play him. I think he, he's got options here. Yeah, 100%. You know, there's a bunch of different ways you can stack it. And really, um, you know, we're not seeing all that much ownership. Like Dulcich might steam or whatever. Cortland Sutton might steam you know, to 12%, but is 12% really a lot of ownership? Yeah, I don't think so, you know? No. So same thing on the other side with Vegas. Um Josh Jacobs, he's going to be the most popular, and we're showing him about 16, 17% right now. Um, I'll pass. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a little bit high, uh, but he is a piece if you're running it back with super, um, you know, unpopular plays on the other side. I think that's perfectly playable. And of course, you can play Devontae literally every single week against absolutely everybody. It doesn't matter. So, it really doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the games that uh, I think you can target for some low ownership. I mean, overall, uh, you know, as as kind of projections are starting to flesh out here, um, it does look like things are going to be kind of spread. So, um, you know, I think there's some some good ways in addition to the couple of games that we've already talked about to to continue to get different, but with some very high powered offenses. And quickly, I'll just mention like Dallas um, against Minnesota's pass defense. That's a really good spot. Yep. Um I totally think you can get to this. I can I think you get to uh some Michael Gallup. I think you can mm-hmm. play CD again who exploded last week and I think you can also play some Noah Brown. I, I ran some sort of shell teams 
earlier today, uh, and I got kind of an embarrassing amount of of Noah Brown. So um, he's going to pop a little bit. And I don't think that's something you need to like totally shy away from. Right. So I think there's some hidden pieces in a lot of these really powerful offenses that we can get to uh, in some other games. And lastly, I think the Cincinnati pass game, right. um, It's kind of getting ignored from a lot of the industry because Jamar Chase is out. Right. Well, it's just, all the now you're speaking my language. I've been I've been on four <laughs> football shows this week, and this is the game I can't get off my mind. Yeah, I mean this is an excellent spot. Uh, Pittsburgh's terrible, you know. Now yep. we do have to kind of be aware that Minka Fitzpatrick did practice in full today, yep. but yep, like know. let's not kid like each other. He had an appendectomy literally last Saturday. Okay, so <laughs> are, like are we really going to play an an NFL game? a week after having a major, him play. a major surgery like you know so we got to keep an eye on that and that that does make a significant difference to uh, Pittsburgh's defense right but um you know Cincinnati's passing game still has uh more advantages than you know they got they got more guys than Minka Fitzpatrick can cover himself right so um yeah. i think now that Jamar Chase is out they're going to we saw what the the uh, workload that Joe Mixon got right they're the if if he's rolling, they're just going to feed him the football. Mm-hmm. So at 7,400, at 16% ownership as of right now, I think that number is, the ownership number is quite low. And I think, um, you know, I did, in my shell teams, as I alluded to earlier, uh, I got nearly double that. So mm-hmm. just in, you know, just run vanilla projections and, and see what pops out. I got twice that. So um, a lot of Cincinnati is going to be popping as well. And I think both T Higgins and Tyler Boyd, perhaps at, you know, slightly elevated price tags for right. their production, you know, th- thus far this season, but 6,500 Tyler Boyd as the fold number two, when he's likely to get, um, you know, eight targets in this game, at least uh, there, there's absolute upside that is not priced in there. So uh, I think getting to both of those guys is perfectly warranted and, and playing Burrow as well. You're only going to get him at about 5% right now. So, um, you know, some really attackable, high powered offenses that you know due to injuries or or whatever perhaps might be getting overlooked um as we sort of have a you know the new shiny toy dangled in front of our eyes in like a Justin Fields or whatever so right. um don't forget about all of these other really high powered offenses that can still put up a lot of points yeah because i and- think uh i think teams like Philly for example could very well come out and just like blow the doors off this week Right. And one of the things I love about Pittsburgh and the way that I've used them effectively as their offense has become terrible, um, the, the PPR side of it is just yeah. massive still. Yeah. Deontay Johnson, it would be your PPR guy. We know Pickens is super talented, so he's your home run guy on the on the run back. And then Najee Harris at 5,500. I know he didn't quite get there last week. He he had the three goal line carries that he didn't get in, and then they they snaked two from him. With oh, that was frustrating. Pickens. And yeah. then Harris ended up with 99 yards rushing, so he didn't get the bonus, you know. Yeah, yeah. But 5,500 for the workload and the time on the field is something I'm open to, but I'm also worried about his health a little bit. Um, however, if Minka Fitzpatrick's going to play, I'm going to assume that they're going that he's going to play too. Um, yep. You know, I'm just they're a tough team in general. Uh, they, you know, they play through a lot. They just don't have a lot of talent. But I, I think that the runbacks in this game are really interesting as well. You play one of Pickens and Najee or you play one of Pickens and Harris maybe you don't even need to go that far just play one of those three and I think you're in okay shape and I'm going to give the millionaire maker really really weird play at right at this current moment look since both these teams love to run three wide receiver sets for obvious reason for the Bengals when they have Chase out there they have hit Chase Higgins Boyd how could you not love that but Trenton Irwin is my okay. super sneaky guy okay and, and, and look, this is, this is, this is 150. You're playing 150. You throw them into a couple lineups out of the 150. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm going to play track. I don't even know if he'll make a lineup of mine, but I want to get a little bit creative and, and utilize the fact that I think this team will keep trying to play their offense the way their yeah. offense runs. And if it works with Mixon, they'll keep running through Mixon. If it works with Higgins, they'll keep feeding him the ball. If they start doubling him, it'll be all Boyd or Irwin or Taylor. I just can't figure out which one between Irwin and Taylor. I know they sound ridiculous, and maybe it's because I'm in showdown mode because it's Thursday. But <laughs> yeah. these guys did 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 cross for me as uh, unowned. And it's interesting because even your ownership has Trent and Irwin at two and a half percent. Uh, probably somebody else is talking about him at least. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, like he's on somebody's radar as well. So and right. he's and he's 
you know, the flat men for, for a receiver here. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, if you're playing a bunch of Cincinnati teams, which I think can be warranted, you know, you, you could just throw these guys in 20 max for sure. They're absolutely playable. I think this Cincinnati offense is playable in single entry and, and three max teams, you know, they, they are that strong. And obviously we saw what, uh, what they can do when they just give the ball to, to one guy and they just start rolling, you know, they, they're just not going to take their foot off the gas. So, um, and Pittsburgh is pretty unlikely to be able to stop them. Uh, yep. They're laying, I think, you know, five or six on the road here. Um, now it is a divisional, you know, an interdivision game. So, um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, trepidation that you might need to have and, and laying a big number on the road um, and just like smashing the, you know, the, the favorite there, um, you know, so to your point, I like running it back with some Najee Harris and some Deontay Johnson uh, mm-hmm. or even some Pickens at, you know, it definitely he like he's overpriced at 52. Right. But is he? Um, I mean, he, yeah, for, for his production thus far this season Maybe and probably the upside, I, yeah. I, I think he's a little overpriced, um, but it's not like egregious. He's not $800 overpriced necessarily. You're, you're right. Giving him goal line carries right now. I just feel sure. like there's some, there's something to this, this Pickens that they really, they're really into. Obviously they got rid of Claypool and, I know they love Pickens. I, I hear what you're saying, but I just yep. I just think maybe he's a, he's a little bit, uh, I don't know if under underrated from a DFS perspective because of his production, DFS wise. But one of these, all we've seen this happen with Cincinnati before, though. Last year, what did they win? They were on like four millionaire maker things because they gave up not only because they scored points because they gave up a ton of points to teams like the Browns who couldn't score at the time. You know what I mean? And yep. it wasn't Nick Chubb running the ball; it was Baker Mayfield throwing for five hundred yards. Like weird stuff always seems to happen in these Cincinnati games. I just want to be a part of it. Yeah, I'm with you. I I I think there could be a little bit of you know like sneaky points from Pittsburgh here. That's why I kind of mentioned that um, we got to be careful sometimes just smashing a a big road favorite in a division game uh, because some you know these teams know each other even though there's some new faces. But um, overall, you know these teams play twice a year, so um, yeah. I don't the first think... one, the first one is going to make no one want to play this game. But it was the first game of the season. That, that, yeah. that really bizarre 20 to 20, it was the weirdest game I've ever seen yeah, in my life. Exactly. And, you know, to your point, I mean, Cincinnati is, you know, they have a, a pretty good defense. Um, you know, they're they're in the top, call it third, in, in both passing defense and rushing defense. Favorable schedule, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we got to take strength of schedule in, into account there. Um, you know, but from their defense, they're not actually – uh, providing all that much value in terms of expected points added. I know we're kind of getting into the yeah. advanced metrics weeds here a little bit, but um, you know they, they are susceptible despite what some of the surface numbers may suggest. So um, that said, you know to your point, I, I I'm going to play like I played a boatload of Najee last week. I'm going to play him again, and at 5,500, I think the price for the volume is uh, is just too low. So mm-hmm. um, if he doesn't get vultured on, on two scores at the goal line or, or gets in or whatever, doesn't get hurt in the first quarter. Um, he certainly cracks a hundred yards and, and has mm-hmm. one, if, if not multiple scores in that game. So um, I think he's also one of the we've obvious seen, pieces. We've seen, we've seen have, I mean, I think he's got six, five, maybe it's not that many. It's it's somewhere between four and six, 10 target games in his career. Um, which is from a PPR standpoint is just like a dream, you know? Yeah, exactly. They will use him a little bit out of the passing game and or out of the backfield in the passing game. And if they are trailing, like I expect them to be, um, you know, a, a pass catching back with a lot of rushing upside is, you know, is a pretty good value piece, you know, at, mm-hmm. at a really good price. So I think it's, um, you mm-hmm. know, a, an un, another unpopular spot or perhaps a, a little ignored spot that you can get to um, in the afternoon games. Yeah, and by the way, for ignore sure. the thing for all you guys watching. Ignore the time on this. It's it's a one twenty five game. I don't know why Saber Sim still has it at one tw- at five twenty. Um, I know that was the original slated time because it's a rivalry game kind of a thing, but they moved. They got bumped. Yeah. So it's a one twenty five game. All right. Let's just before we get out of here. Is there any other plays that maybe stood out to you from a you know I know there's other games we could talk about, and I think this week has more. I mean. Detroit and New York, um, the Baltimore offense, I think is going to have some ownership. We, we talked about Atlanta, Chicago. Um, I, I mean, I think that there's a, 
an argument for, probably Higby is the answer, but like the Rams without cup, it's kind of weird to lose like the highest usage receiver, the highest usage part of your offense by a landslide, a guy who's responsible for more than half of your offense. Yep. And then nobody's going to get played in that game. So that's something that kind of stood out to me. Uh, Philadelphia Indy is a kind of an interesting game. And we talked about sort of little bits of the other ones, but is there any sort of plays and things that you're, you sort of thought would be projected a little bit higher or things you thought might be more owned things that you like, especially, and, and you don't care that the ownership is high. What sort of stands out to you this week sort of as a, from a whole, I know it's kind of a hard question, but anything that you sort of like this week, whether it's you're willing to eat the chalk or you're willing to fade the chalk um, or you're willing to take a shot on guys who are just being way under projected. Yeah. First of all, I think we can, you know, you alluded to the Detroit or excuse me, the, um, the Atlanta offense a little bit earlier. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And Marcus Mariota, I think he's had an excellent price right now at what 55, I think. And um, I think this is, you know, if we're expecting Chicago to score and well, their defense has been awful all season, you know, like part of the reason that they, have had to score and that their offense has been able to put up so many points because their defense can't stop anybody, you know? So uh, let's not forget that Atlanta can score a little bit here too. So I think getting to kind of an ignored Marcus Mariota at a really good price here is, you know, something we could probably take a look at. So, um, you know, in some other kind of custom metrics that I have, he's also popping to the top of the of the quarterback board so um you know in a high total game you know they're expected to score and and they're laying points here so i think this is warranted to get to this offense i I like quarter patterson um he's unowned i play him all the time uh this he's just got a boatload of upside um and in the passing game i think you can i mean you're you're exactly right pitts is going to garner most of the ownership in this spot Mm -hmm. um but i think you can kind of pivot off of that a little bit because well pitts has been kind of perpetually disappointing literally every single week this year so um if you want to just say to hell with it and jump off that train just go play drake london instead you know he's still getting a lot of the work and he's at 5100 um 700 more expensive than kyle pitts and you're going to get probably half the ownership on him you know so yeah um and if we're expecting a lot of points, well, he's the number one wide receiver. Why wouldn't it go to him? You okay, know, well, so I, I think that's so a way love, to, good way to look I, at it. I love everything you're saying. And, and here's my uh, here's my big question marks for this game. What do I believe happens? Okay, Atlanta coming off of an important home law, uh, important uh, road loss, excuse me, um, at Carolina. Uh, and they'll, they'll have 10 days. So th- they were very adamant in the previous game. The previous game against Carolina, they ran the ball 40 times and they were splitting carries between Huntley, Patterson and Al mm-hmm. And they basically ran split carries until certain moments popped up in the last game. Is the, is the, is losing enough going to make them realize that maybe we should stick with our best, put our best foot forward. And the problem <laughs> is, while I like Patterson, they really like these guys. Yeah. Um, just from every, from all accounts. And and I kind of like these guys too. They run the ball so much. They throw the ball less than any team. And that's what scares me. Cause I love the London and Pitts combo, which would make it natural. You'd want to play Mariota, especially mm-hmm. a quarterback with a little bit of rushing upside himself. Yep. So they run the ball so often. That's all they want to do is run the ball. My worry is that they have too much success running the ball. And it's all three of the guys. My other thought is, well, what if it turns back into the quarter Patterson show? That 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 seems very, very possible to me because I really want to play parts of this game. And Patterson at no ownership in a game that's got the highest total on the slate is definitely appealing to me. In fact, I was getting a little too creative earlier and I was trying to talk myself into Al Gear because yeah. I was thinking maybe they could go that route too. I really think it's an interesting thing to figure out. The problem I have with Mariota is simply that he hasn't eclipsed 24 fantasy points, even in the best matchups of the season. And that would be a fine number at 5,500. It's hard to win a tournament with that number. Yep. Um, and you basically need to get it exactly right. It needs to go to London and Pitts. Cause if I'm playing him, I'm probably playing him with both. Cause that's a cheap stack right there, but you kind of need both those guys to score. <laughs> um, and then you get into, well, then I'm taking away my Justin, my favorite part of this game, which is the, the possibility that Justin Fields scores 40 fantasy points. But mm-hmm. I do like, I do like Montgomery with no Herbert behind him. So, I can play just him, but then it kind of makes the game sort of stall out. So I like it more from the Chicago with the Atlanta run back side of it. That's my personal take, but I like the points you're making that this passing game is being, I don't want to say under owned because I actually understand why it's being under owned, 
but it is certainly very low owned for a game that we expect to be the highest scoring game in the slate in a dome with no worries at the end of November, where we're other teams, we have to worry about wind and snow and stuff. There's a lot of things to like it against the team that's given up the most points this month. Um, there's a lot to like here. So I like the idea of getting creative a bunch of different ways with it. You don't need to make only one stack of this. You know what I mean? You can yep. make all these different kinds. Take the Corderell Patterson shots. Take the shots where you do have the Mar- Mariota with London and, and Pitts. You know what I mean? And But mostly for me, I'm going to side on, this, on the Chicago side. This yeah, one. I think that's per- I think that I think that's perfectly valid. And um, you know, I think it's it just kind of goes to show that um, you know, there's plenty of ways you can play this game. And mm-hmm. if if we're expecting points and the market is expecting points, yeah, there's several different ways and and all of them are really viable. Um mm-hmm. you know, you can even play backup running backs. You know, that like they they are splitting and, and giving Algier some work. Right. So Mm -hmm. it's it's not totally unheard of that if you hit this game really hard with 30 teams or something like that, that you get a little bit of the backup running back Mm -hmm. uh, in the especially if you have outsized exposure to Cordero Patterson. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I think that's perfectly fine. And really nobody in this game outside of fields is going to come in, you know, at like more than 10 percent. Like, right. Maybe maybe pits. Right. Right. We're showing him at 11 percent right now. So. yeah, really good spot, pretty much top to bottom to get to a lot of different pieces in this game. And also, I, I did mention it. Um, you know, we ha- we haven't really talked about any defenses that we like. I I don't think playing the Falcons defense is the worst thing in the world here. Uh, if we are kind of re- expecting that Fields is not necessarily going to be able to run for 180 yards every week, <laughs> you know, it, and that they don't throw the football it's not totally crazy that the Falcons defense could put up a decent performance here. And at at 3,300, like not saying we get, you know, a full 10% of the Falcons or anything, but um, you know, that that's also another, you know, consideration of, of a different way to play the game and and get exposure to it. It really just depends on, um, Mm -hmm. you know, how you assess everything and, and really where you want to focus. Obviously it's not the most likely route, right? The defense is just, stifle everybody Mm -hmm. but let's not forget for the first half of the season um you know chicago's offense was awful and you just couldn't go near them right so they have unlocked some stuff but yeah they're there's such um, thing as regression we all know it exactly their earlier tendencies you know don't just evaporate overnight necessarily so um you know just another caveat i guess but no i'm i'm with you i think there's plenty of ways to play this game um i guess your to your question earlier one one more, I guess maybe a couple of guys um, that I'm kind of, I'm, I'm pretty high on that maybe, um, you know, are seeing some ownership. I would say Saquon would probably be number one. He's going to be popular for sure. Um, yeah, so, 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 so let me just throw that out to you for tournaments yeah. real quick. Cause I, cause I, cause I, this, is my, this is my counter to Saquon being a good play. Mm, okay. So 8,900, unless you're, so this week, if you're playing Saquon to me, you're not using a running back in the flex or you have three really cheap receivers that you love because you're, you're talking about a guy who has, again, he's been awesome all year, still hasn't eclipsed 30 fantasy points, does have the nut matchup. You know what I mean? He's got all everything going for him. Going to be popular. 8,900 versus Justin Jefferson at 91. Even though I actually like Saquon to outscore Jefferson more often, I would rather have the 40 fantasy points when the, my guy goes off than the, the sub 30 games does that make sense and yeah also, absolutely don't snakes touchdowns away from him so yeah absolutely he's and got five this year and jones had three going into the last game that, that's what was going to the last game i don't know what it is right now but anyway sorry go ahead go yeah ahead. no no you're exactly right and and i think that's perfectly valid and a really good illustration as to how and why we can fade guys at expensive price tags right um just it, it's sort of a general roster construction and, and game theory um sort of sense right Mm -hmm. that like there are there are guys with higher you know realized upside um than than saquon has shown this season right he still hasn't popped for a 45 point game or whatever and we know that joe mixon has and we know that justin jefferson has and Mm -hmm. um you know, so that, that's a very valid concern. Lamb just put up 40 last week. Exactly. You know, and, and he's what, 2K cheaper. Twice, yeah. Yeah, 100 percent. So it's a very valid concern that we need to be aware of when we're 
um, considering rostering guys at these super expensive price tags. Uh, and the the way I would actually play Saquon or prefer to play Saquon was to your point, play him with Daniel Jones and Ooh. capture a little bit of that Ooh. that rushing upside, pretty much the entire rushing offense. Oh, that's from interesting. From these guys, because like last week, for example, in a really, really good matchup, they gave him 35 carries and mm-hmm. one target out of the backfield. Like that is, that that's Derrick Henry type of workload. And right. we haven't seen this from Saquon literally since he's been in the league uh, because he got hurt. Right. Yeah. So, and, and even when he wasn't, they were very worried about him because he, he was the, he was too herky jerky and he was the kind of guy who was going to get injured, which he actually ended up getting injured. So they were right, but they weren't going to, they weren't letting him have those. I don't think he had 30 carries ever that I've knew of. Right. So this is like, they trust him now. And really he like, who is, who is dimes throwing the football to like, there's no OBJ there anymore well, or I'm, anything like that. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah, we obviously you... have Wandale, but um, like these guys don't have the, the explosive upside that some of the other passing offenses really do. So they want to run all of the offense or as much as they can through Saquon. So I think playing like a Daniel Jones, who was projecting very, very well here. I, the I am playing Daniel Jones a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. He play him with Wandale, play him with Darius Slayton, do whatever, but also play him with Saquon because you're capturing pretty much all of the offense because and they're not going to use, the, they're not going to use the tight end. Right. So it's going to be yep. the, the the number one and number two receivers, Darius Slayton and Wandale, and and it's going to be Saquon. So most of the production is going to come through those guys. So I think that's another kind of contrarian or, um, you know, semi overlooked spot that we can get to in another game that it's probably the best spot of the week, to be quite honest. I'm so I, I I love what you said here. I, I really am on this. And it's funny because the last thing I was going to ask you about for my my weird thing was I, I, there, I haven't been playing them much, but I, I every week I go to my mind, how can I not play a Giants receiver? Yeah. And, and, you know, and this is the week where I'm like, I don't know how to do it, but I actually kind of like the idea of the Jones and Saquon. And I'm for people. Oh, they eat into each other and this and that. Maybe against the Lions, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, yep. You know what I mean? That's the thing. Yeah, exactly. Especially Maybe they score, if they score 42 points here and then there's, two, there's what, Saquon has two rushing touchdowns and 180 yards. And mean, or maybe he catches one. And and Daniel Jones has has one rushing touchdown, ninety yards rushing, and he also happened to throw for throw a touchdown to somebody else, and he's fifty seven hundred. Like that, that's totally on the board for me. And I'm just trying to figure out. Like I, I have a friend, uh, well known guy. He he literally had the nuts at every position, and he had Kenny Galladay at receiver. If he would have Christian Watson, <laughs> he had two hundred and yeah. whatever two hundred and twenty something fantasy points or something like that with 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 Kenny Galladay at receiver um last week so he basically had the nuts for for his amount you know for the amount of salary uh, allocated but i don't think galladay is the answer obvious and, and look i'm it's his former team i'm actually probably going to take some stupid flyer in a 20 dollar tournament i'll just hand someone 20 dollars. it's fine if it happens if i have if it happens and it, i'm ro- like i'm wrong i lose 20 bucks I, I, well no if it happens if i'm right i lose 20 bucks if it happens if it happens and i didn't have any part of it i'm going to lose my mind yeah. Because I cannot understand why a guy who two years ago I thought was going to be one of the better receivers in the NFL has become what he is. Um, I actually think Darius Slayton is is the guy I would go the most with. I think followed by Wandale, and then the Hodgins thing is a long shot play. But you're you're really talking about a team that likes to run it. So I'm I'm into this. I'm going to get a Daniel Jones and Barkley stacked together. Um, and 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 if it's a lower scoring week, especially. That, that could really pay off. And, and then you have an easy run back with the uh, St. Brown. And I don't mind Jamal Williams. He's gotten all the work um, instead of Swift, if, if that's the way it goes. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I like that idea that you threw out there. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, just to kind of corroborate this here, the last two quarterbacks that we talked about, Daniel Jones, Marcus Mariota, they're projecting in the top seven along there with Dak Fields, yeah. Allen Hurts, and Lamar, okay? And yeah. point per dollar, Mariota and and Dimes are the two best projected quarterback plays of the week so far. Right, um, right. So, you know, they're, they're down here sub 6,000, and it's like they, they get some bad defenses. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, in, if we look forward to next Monday, you know, how, how many times – you know, if we run this slate 10 times, how many times are we just going to look back and be like, well, I mean, Christ, we didn't just play 
the Giants against Detroit or the Falcons against the Bears? I mean, these teams are bad. Why don't yeah. we just play the offenses against them? You know what I mean? Oftentimes we run into that with like really good offenses. Why don't we just play the Bills? Why don't we, you know, why don't we just play the Bengals or whatever? Like, well, this is kind of one of those spots. Detroit and Chicago have both proved that they can't stop anybody on defense. So, um, you know, and all these guys are in the NFL and they're cheap. So I think uh, taking some punts on them uh, is pretty warranted. Like these, these offenses can still put up some points. Yeah. I hear you, man. Hey man, I really love doing this with you because it really helps from a different perspective, understanding it. I think that we should do like a Q and a with you one night with some of the people. Cause I really like your perspective on a lot of this stuff. Um, is there anything else you want to touch on before we get out of here? I have a call in a few minutes that I've got to get on. Um, anything else you want to, you want to throw out there before we, before we get out of here? No, man, I think, um, you know, to keep an eye out for the projections again, uh, we still got a lot of injury news kind of rolling in and, you know, who knows, they may move the freaking new Orleans game to like Toronto or something or, or whatever <laughs> they're going to do. Um, so keep an eye out over the next couple of days. It is only Thursday right now. So a lot of things can change still here in the next couple of days, but, um, you know, I, I think this week is a, is a good week to, um, you know, kind of take some risks and, and get to some plays that some other, or, you know, the rest of the industry might, uh, not be totally on. So, um, usually that means it's a good tournament week. So, uh, hopefully, you know, somebody can, um, can capitalize on all of this. Hopefully they have true DFS in their logo or they're a part of our site, at least. Um, yeah. thanks so much, Goldie. Awesome job as always, man. Really appreciate all the great work you've been doing. And guys, if you don't look at it right now, like really, really take advantage of this. We'll have it again for MLB season. We're going to try and get it for the other sports. It's a little harder with basketball because of the late subs and it's really hard to get an aggregate, but Goldie's done an incredible job. So I really encourage you to use his projections wisely. It's really, really beneficial. Um, and uh, with that, Goldie, we're out of here and uh, good luck this weekend, my friend, and good luck to all the true DFSers. Good luck, everybody.